we'd feel better if only we'd talk about it. Well, we did talk about it. We don't feel any better. If anything, we feel worse. Before, we thought it was just us, 35 to 54-year-old men, the grumpiest generation in history. But since nobody's been taking any notice of anything we say for years, we didn't expect anyone to do anything about it. And they didn't. Now we know it's not just us. Now we know that most of the population is every bit as grumpy as we are. We want to know why nobody has done anything about all the things that hack us off. And heaven knows there's enough of them. It's every single thing, every single aspect of your life. You can't eat that egg, you can't eat that steak, you can't drive there, you can't do this, you can't do that. It drives me up the wall. Do you know we can't give anybody aspirins in this blinking restaurant? We can't give people headache pills. I get up in the morning now and wait for the phone to ring from some government office telling me when I can have my first shit. The worst thing about mass travel is that the masses travel. The holidays are complete torture. You think, everybody's roasting and dogging except for me. Do you examine your balls? No, never. Exactly. There are better things to do with your balls. <laughs> I don't put my finger up my bottom, thank you. I've been six days without a cigarette and, frankly, I could tear your fucking head off. <laughs> So it's that time of the year again. You're back from your holidays and back to that dreadful grinding routine that makes up our daily lives. Every day you seem more and more out of step with the rest of the world. They're going east and you're going west. And while most of your life it was clearly everyone else on the planet who was facing the wrong way, these days you're not quite so sure. It's the same old set of jackasses in the office. You'd like to tell them to stick the job where the sun doesn't shine, but your endowment mortgage has crashed and the pension has evaporated. The holidays were an irritation from start to finish. What were the kids, the hotel, the food and other people? Came down in buckets where you were, and you arrived home to find postcards from all the people you hate, telling of sunny days and fun-filled nights. Everything that anybody does seems designed to make you even grumpier. Or is it just me? So, this being a television program, and it being after nine, we should, of course, be talking about sex. It's everywhere. Every TV program, every advertising billboard, every high street. You can buy vibrators over the counter at Boots now. Every newspaper you pick up is full of stories about overpaid and oversex footballers or ways to enhance your orgasm. It's gay this and four in a bed that. And we're reading about all this over our breakfast table, over our golden Grahams, for heaven's sake. I've reached an age now where I can think of so many more interesting things than anybody's sex life. Honestly, I, I, what, I just can't... It's like, what position are they doing it? Well, I've done that, you know, I've tried that, I've been there, I've had that, I've had... You know, you kind of think, what... Why is it such a big deal anymore? Why does oral sex have to be performed? Other, or, other sex acts, you can do them or have them or share them with a friend, but oral sex must be performed. All right, love, from the top. If you believe the media about sex, you'd assume that everybody in the world was having more sex in you more often and better sex. There's never any middle range in these things, is there? No one just went home and had quite nice sex and that was it. No, eight times a night he was an animal in bed or he was absolutely useless in bed. And they never say, you know, oh, I met that uh, Roy McGrath in the hotel, he took me back to his room. We had disappointing mediocre sex for up to three minutes and then he switched on CFAX to see if there were any Arsenal news, you know, which is, of course, what happens in real life. You know? And the worst thing of all is the internet, responding to the most innocent inquiry with a worldwide cesspit of vile sleaze. I was looking yesterday for a bike for my daughter. Rally chopper bike. <laughs> 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 She's looking at 
my shoulder. Straight in there. <laughs> I don't want one of those. He's got his willy in her mouth. What I think has happened has been a kind of sexual uh, inflation. Back in the 50s, naughty vicar runs off with Starlet. That is really titillating and gets people in their flannel nighties very, very excited on a Sunday morning. Then it has to get a bit more explicit through the 60s and 70s, and it does, and the sun arrives, naked breasts appear, and everybody is excited about that. And... With every move, people become jaded. And so you have to push further and further. You know, it has to be kind of lesbian, three-in-a-bed S&M action before anybody will even kind of raise an eyebrow now. There's a fruit fly that makes one sperm twice as long as its own body. Why doesn't the sun pick up on this stuff? What's all this rubbish about David Beckham? It's much more interesting than footballers. But for certain over-the-hill footballers, as for our grumpies, sex has become almost exclusively a spectator sport. The latest thing is watching other people having sex in cars, giving a few sad souls a whole new reason to take the dog for a walk. There's been places near where I've lived where all this dogging goes on, where people drive up to car parks and watch one another having sex in cars or joining in. Now, I never knew about it when I lived there. I've only read about it when people have been caught doing it by the police and I've read it in the paper. I thought, well, that car park was where I used to live. Dogging and roasting are these horrible words and they're revolting activities, aren't they? I mean, I don't know how they think this stuff up, really. I mean, what's wrong with just sex? Dogging is, is just a new word Dogging, for an no, old story. No, that's you no, were doing no, that ages. Orgies. Or Orgies used to be the thing. It used to be. And now they're and just now alfresco. It's, yeah, it's just alfresco. It's used orgies. top gears, making them do it in cars. <laughs> I, it's I you was... saying this car would rip the knicker elastic off a Belgian nun at, and they're all out there watching each other have each other in Vauxhall Vectors. What a dog. So if you feel inspired by Top Gear to go out for a bit of dogging, you'll need one of these. Man's best friend, supposedly. And if you're as miserable as some of our grumpies, he's probably your only friend. But what were the food bills, the doggy toys, the vet bills, the inoculations, the doggy dentist, the hairs on the carpet? Even that relationship is wearing a bit thin. The thing about dog owners is they don't realise that dogs smell. And they say, oh, they only smell when they get wet and dirty. No, no, they don't. They smell all the time. You walk into a house where there's a dog and you can smell it. Pets are lovely, especially when they're young and fluffy. When they get old and smelly, and they ain't too clever. A bit like humans, really. Dogs will sniff your ass, and cats will show you theirs. Uh, and to be honest, in neither case can you get a decent conversation. You can never tell when he'll show up. He gives you plenty of trouble. Now, if a man laid a pile of steaming turd on the grass or pavement in front of you, cleaned his own bottom, then came bounding up to you, attempting to lick your face, you'd waste the bastard. And any jury in the land would call it justifiable homicide. So why on earth do we accept it from dogs? I'm sick to death of those selfish people who allow their dogs to crap all over a nice park and walk away from it. You know, somebody's got to clear it up. I never cleared the crap up. I never, I never cleared the crap up. I used to blame it on other dogs. I wouldn't go around crapping in the park. Well, not, <laughs> not during daylight hours. And if I did, I'd be ashamed and clear it up. And these dogs are just going everywhere, aren't they? When you see some sort of perfectly nice, reasonable-looking uh, man or woman smiling with adoration as their pet actually defecates right outside your front door, um, and quite often looking up as if you, you know, <laughs> you're going to applaud this. I mean, we wouldn't do it with our children. If I see a dog crapping outside my house, I'll go out and I'll kick it up the arse. Or I'll get a bucket of water and I'll throw it over it. You do see a lot of people picking it up now. I don't know whether there are people just going around, you know, picking up dog shit and taking it home and going, look at that, got a new one today. Look at that, it's dried out nicely. Do you take your pet to the park? Yeah. What park? Kensington Gardens. With a pooper scooper? Of course not. You just leave the crap on the ground? It doesn't crap. I, I, I specifically asked for one that doesn't crap. <laughs> <laughs> I spent the last nine years living in the dog shit capital of the world. 
Brussels. And when it rains in Brussels, it's kind of B-movie rain. It comes straight down. And I said to people complaining about the rain, hey, hey, don't complain about the rain in Brussels. It shows there is a merciful God. Because if we didn't get the streets washed repeatedly by the rain, we'd all be dead of dog shit. Well, I know we said that dogs crapping in public was the worst thing, but as usual, there's an even worse thing than that. And you know what it is, don't you? Yes, that's right. It's dogs who pick you out in a crowd and decide you are something they want to copulate with. Do do dogs have two attitudes towards me. They either want to kill me or they want to have sex with me. Uh, neither of which is an option that I particularly welcome. You know, how could they mistake that for a bitch? My, my Trevor is a golden retriever and he's had his snip. And he still tries to mount things. And I, said, I wonder if he's got a brain sometimes. We had some people for lunch just yesterday, brought their dog, and it did this the whole lunch. <laughs> it's incredibly lifelike. You really it's, are like a big dog. How annoying is that? You think to go. I eventually said to the, the father, the owner of this thing, if that dog comes near me again, I'm going to stick this fork in its arm. <laughs> I love dog owners because they have this absolutely total idea that you love their dogs as much as they do. You know, so that thing, oh, well, he's only playing. You know, well, he's actually biting my leg off, you know. And lest we should be accused of singling out dogs for our grumping... Cats do this thing. They bring in rats and let them go. And then they can't catch them again. And people say, oh, it's a present for you. you think, well, the cat knows what I eat. I eat pizza and sandwiches. I don't eat fucking voles. I just think there's something a bit sick about people who own pets. I could be offending a lot of people now. The sun has got his hat on. Hip, 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 hooray. The sun has got his hat on and he's coming. No, with all these irritations everywhere we look, it's important for grumpies to get away from it all. A couple of weeks in the summer to leave behind all those cares and woes which tyrannise us the other 50 weeks of the year. Something you can look forward to all the year round. Family holiday! Mum and Dad sort of mooning aimlessly along the seafront in the bad weather with the, with the 15-year-old girl who's sulking and would rather be having sex with the waiter, which he will be doing later and getting in trouble. The boy who just wants to be at home with his PlayStation. People have holidays and it's, it, they shouldn't do it, really. And the planning of it and that's sort of like the reality. <laughs> the sort of like throwing sort of strops and buggering off, you know, jumping out of the car and saying, I'm not coming back and going home. I once went to Brittany with my wife. We got there, got off the boat, looked at it, turned around and came straight back. I, you know. Just the sight of one Frenchman looking in an electrical appliance shop, I knew I didn't want to be there. Home I came. I've never really been on holiday. I went, I went once with my wife and we both hated it. And we couldn't bear We wanted to be home as soon as possible. My ideal holiday would be me on my own somewhere where I didn't know anybody. So the plane is due to take off at a civilised 9am. What they don't tell you is that that means check-in at 6, which means leaving your house at 4.30, which means waking up at 3.30. The suitcases won't close, you've lost the tickets, the taxi is late. And when you get there, you find there's a four-hour delay, so you hit the bar for a pint of warm lager. Everything associated with air travel is a pain in the arse, and it's because airline companies need to treat you like an imbecile. You have to turn up hours and hours before you need to, just so they can have you there, so they can sort of herd you around like, um, you know, lemmings or sheep, you know. I absolutely just abhor the, 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 all the travelling part of travel. I mean, I really still do enjoy the, the getting there and, and seeing new things, but it, gets, it just gets worse and worse. They've cut the price so much they can do without those things like... Uh, charm, efficiency, punctuality, you know, getting your luggage there, all those things, you've, you, the fiver that you paid for the... That's what it just covers getting you there, you know. Um, horrible. I was lucky because we got upgraded to sitting down. When you go to an airport and the woman arrives with a huge bloody great pram and the, and the host is all smiling, lovely, we'll do it up for you, we'll look after it, that's fine, and it all goes on the plane. I got my golf clubs on an advertised golfing holiday with this airline, and they charged me 40 quid to put me clubs on the fucking plane. 
It's unbelievable. The secret is, is to put wheels on the golf clubs and strap a kid to it, and then you get them off there for nothing. There's always someone that gets on the plane late, isn't there? Who's like they've they've missed their call, and they've and that means you miss your uh, your, your, your your taking off uh, gap. I'm always the one who gets clapped when I come on board because I can't stand sort of sitting in a lounge waiting to get on the plane with everyone. And that, isn't it funny? Everyone jumps up at the same time, and. I, the plane's not going to go without you. Your bags are on board. Just wait. I saw a bloke on a plane. He was just revolting. He was shouting about West Ham the whole time. And he had a fag, the bastard, which I couldn't do. And uh, he was arrested on arrival, of course. And some of the food. I mean, it's like being married, isn't it? It's absolute shit. I, I mean, they, if you talk about health warnings and health and safety, they should tell you what some of it is. It really is unbelievable. What is this whole seat back in the upright position? Bollocks. You know, we're going to crash, we're going to crash. I want to crash leaning back. And why is it that when you take your seat, you're always the one who's going to be sitting next to the first-time flyer, the sweaty sumo wrestler, or worse than any of these, the proud parent? When you get onto a plane now, and the mother, or the father, I suppose, for that matter, comes down the aisle with the newborn baby... I'd stamp on it. There's no... <laughs> just... Why? And they go, oh, yeah. <laughs> It's going to scream and we're going to New Zealand! I recently flew to the States where this over-proud over father started changing a nappy in the seat next to me. He goes, oh, isn't he lovely? Isn't he a good boy? This stinking, fetid nappy. I mean, it's beyond belief. And what is it like when you get there? By day, the rows and rows of British tourists gently barbecuing themselves under the searing heat on overcrowded beaches, the sunburn, the kids urinating in the pool, the fish and chips. By night, the happy hour, the disco, the lights, the karaoke, the curry, the girls, the drinks, the drunks, the dancing, the sex in the street and on the beach, the condoms floating in the shallows. Then there's all that foreign food that the Continentals insist on eating. Have we brought the anti-diarrhoea tablets? Is the water bottled and is the seal intact? Of course, those crafty foreigners have probably filled them straight from the sewage pipe and we're all going to spend four days locked in a lavatory which seems to have been designed specifically to encourage you to examine your own poo. It just collects the turds in a neat thing and then when you flush it, it washes them all away. And that's rather upsetting, because it's kind of like... It's almost like you've, you, you have a good look at what you've produced. You can't flush toilet paper down the toilet. You have to put it in a separate bin, which actually I think is, is a fine thing to do, because I just hate the idea of you know, all the sewage system having to cope with all this paper. But some people just won't do it at all. They just find it the most appalling thing to have to do, not put your toilet paper. I didn't mind it at all. In fact, I brought all my toilet paper home with me. I was, in fact, I've got it. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll go to a nice little Portuguese village, for example, and, like, five years later when you go back, every other bar is an Irish bar, and they're full of English. You've gone to Portugal, instead of going to a Portuguese bar, you go to an Irish bar. You're drinking Guinness, you're drinking English beer, you're eating English food, and you're watching footy on the big screen on the telly. Well, why can't you do that at home and save yourself a lot of money? The middle-class approach, which is just treat the world as this sort of playground, this sort of semi-colonial approach, where people say, oh, we, we discovered this place that was completely unspoiled, whereas the truth is they spoilt somewhere that was completely undiscovered. And they always say, well, we didn't want to do what the tourists do. You think, well, stay at home then, you miserable bastard. The British are awful people, you know, with their inappropriate socks and ghastly complexions and and stupid desire to eat egg and chips, even though you're in, you know, the best French restaurant in France. The, 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 the boorishness, the inability to speak the local language. I was behind this woman who I think was from, I think was from the north of England, England, and this poor little girl who was serving behind the till had to put up with... She said, Have you got any fags, love? She said, I'm not yet, though. Fags! She said, oh, she don't even understand the fags. <laughs> She's turning to me and I'm sort of cringing. Said, Have you got any fags? <laughs> fags! Fags! How loud do I have to fucking say it before she understands, you know? And there's that, that. They just demonstrate that, frankly, there is a, a layer of people in this country 
that are beyond the pale. So that's the British abroad. Great fat men with Union Jack t-shirts, skinhead haircuts, and red bloated bodies covered with tattoos. Oddly shaped women showing off far more of their bodies than anyone could possibly want to see. And we don't even seem to mind that we're a laughing stock. The most sterling quality of the British without any doubt in my mind is that you can take the piss out of them. They let you do that. And that's, and that's not, there's not many people who do. I mean, I've written whole books that consist of nothing but me making great capital out of, of stereotypes. I think there is something in that. I mean, there is no question that Italians are voluble and, and you know, that people have certain characteristics. Hands up all those nations that occasionally invade Poland. Some comedian somewhere didn't make up the thing about Germans and their towels. It's true. I remember going on a holiday, in fact, it was my honeymoon, to the Canary Islands, and unless you got up at 3.30, you know, there, were, there would be no beds around the pool uh, in the morning because they would all have German towels on them. So it's about 2.30 in the morning and I left the hotel. By the pool, I was like, where are all these torches? And it was, they're all German. You take a swimming pool and we'll take the beach. And it was amazing and I thought, it's true, you know, it's not a lazy racist stereotype. They do it. They just think that they, they are in control of Europe. And so why shouldn't they be in control of the poolside? It's not the towels that bothers me about the Germans, it's more the global conquest, really. I think the towels I'll let go, but when tanks are involved, I think, oi, guys, chill. You can take the Swedes and the French and the Italians and the Irish and you can put them all together and they all do hate the Germans. Oh, yeah, we all hate the Germans. Yeah. That is the one thing we all have in common. Yeah. Well, pretty much the whole world. Yeah. I, I, I believe that people who've never even heard of the Germans would hate them innately. That, that there are people, there are Papua New Guineans who have no I can't, idea, and that they, if you showed them a German, that they would just hate, they would, they would either eat The Americans like the Germans, because I've, I've maintained the Americans and the Germans are the same. <clears throat> Loud trousers, big voices, mullet haircuts. They love them. <laughs> But lest anyone should think only Britain is full of grumpy old bastards who hate everyone else, it's encouraging to know that our former transported convicts feel the same. You want to go to the Cathedral Hotel, please? Do you mind saying that again? And I thought, oh, did I say it wrong? Or was he taking the piss? I said, uh, we'd like to go to the Cathedral Hotel, please. <laughs> Sorry to laugh. Um, are you Kiwis or Poms? And we said, and we're pobs. And, oh, thank fuck for that. Sorry, mates. For a moment, I thought you were a kiwi. I fucking hate kiwis. And then a hundred yards later, he says, come to think of it, I fucking hate pobs as well. And that was it. I thought, that is an introduction to Australia, which would never ever happen in America. If we say, and he does constantly, I really hate Americans. America, do you really hate Americans? I know you do. That's why I said that. Mm. Americans don't care. I mean, why would they? But if you say, I once knew an ugly Welsh girl. Everybody in Wales stays up all night writing a letter to somebody. We don't say we don't like a category of people because we're accused of being racist. We can't like dislike uh, habits because we're accused of being fascists. I mean, it seems to me we can't even laugh at ourselves anymore. Now, being able to laugh at ourselves in Britain is genuinely necessary. Of course, it's the start of the football season. And if you didn't laugh, you'd weep. We love it and we hate it. It's our purest form of masochism. We look forward to it for the entire two-week gap between the end of the last season and the beginning of the new season. And when it comes, like it or not, we're back on the roller coaster. No matter how crap we were last season, we think we'll do better this season. There's no reason to think it, we just do. We watch the transfers on a daily basis. We want to sack the manager and then have to work out a way to buy the new season ticket and the new strip for you and the kids, which is the seventh new strip in five years at a hundred quid a time. I could have bought the fucking team with what I spent on the kit. I mean, it costs more than going to the opera. It costs more than going on holiday for two weeks to Tenerife, a ticket for Chelsea. Some people take their children with their sort of babies, you know, and throw them on the pitch. I mean, not throw them on the pitch, but sort of lift them up with the scores. Hey, how about that then? How about that then? You know, I took their wee. And it's all, it's all seating now, which is sort of fair enough, if everyone sat down. You sit down, and then as soon as anything happens, the, everyone stands up, you have to stand up. And then you sit down again as the ball goes, and then you stand up. 
and then you sit down, and oh, it's absolutely exhausting. You're more knackered than the players by the end, and you've not seen anything. I mean, I know football's important to a lot of people in bobble hats, but honestly, it just seems to have gone berserk. What is more pathetic? You know, you see, say, you know, Newcastle have lost a game, and then at the end, you see, there's always a shot of one solitary Newcastle perform- c- c- supporter sitting there crying. And you think, you big twat, blubbering away. It's just a football match, you bloody idiot. It's like showbiz now. And and, uh, everything becomes like showbiz in the end if you throw money at it, you know. You probably can't blame them, can you? If you give an 18-year-old with no brain £100,000 a week, what do you think he's going to do? He's got to have a Ferrari, a nice, discreet red one. Oh, and the biggest four before he can find, with a very clever number plate. He's got to wear designer clothes and do designer drugs. He's got to drink designer drinks and sport a designer haircut. He's got to live in an appallingly bad-taste Mac mansion and fill it with gaudy marble sculptures of erotic figures. He's got to have sex with at least five girls at a time, some of them even consenting. And since his lifestyle makes it unlikely he'll win any real trophies, he has to have a trophy airhead on his arm who wants her own career as an actress. They ought to be able to dock the wages to make it fair. Not that long ago, David Beckham missed a penalty. No, uh, you know, dock 50 quid off. Many clubs have found the hard way that those players aren't worth £100,000 a week. I mean, look at what's happened to Leeds, look at what's happened to a whole range of top clubs. Yeah, they've paid too much for some very mediocre talent. They're these kind of iconic gods far away, and, of course, that is utterly bad for them, and it turns them into these monsters of roasting and sexual deviancy and raping, and you feel, well, how can I watch these young twats running around on a pitch? I'd rather be reading a book. I mean, I just hate it. It's so much a part of being a bloke that you're not a real bloke unless you stand on a freezing terrace shouting the C word as though the right to use it is about to be taken away from you, arrogating a knowledge of of a game while failing to understand the one key fact that foreigners are better at it. I've always taken the view that real men hang around libraries, particularly poetry libraries and string quartet concerts. And I've never, I've never felt in any way threatened by uh, my lack of interest in football, or cricket as it's sometimes called. I hate the new patriotism where we're all trying to reclaim our Englishness and every few months the whole country is decked out like a loyalist estate and it will be the rugby. No one liked rugby. Rugby was a posh boys game in England. Only the Welsh and public school boys liked rugby and public school boys' girlfriends with their fat asses and their boyfriend's rugby shirt and the collar turned up. No one liked rugby until we won something. Yes, a British victory at sport is as rare as a smile on the face of a grumpy amused, abused, confused and entirely hacked off. Next week, being persecuted by the nanny state. We told you not to get us started. You're looked at, you're numbered, you're tagged, they've got your DNA, they've got your blood, they've got your bank account, they've got your national insurance number, they've got your records, your dental records, your health records. You just are a completely open book. There's nothing left of your individuality. Grumpy's career is Daffod, the only gay in the village, is putting on a gay night. Little Britain over on BBC Three now.